Thank you very much, Massimo, uh, for introducing me. And, and of course, it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, among such a distinguished panel. So uh, it's sort of strange that uh, thus far we have had very historical takes uh, and uh, kind of like detailed analysis. Uh, I'm trying to do the opposite here, uh, being more theoretical, even though I'm not a state theorist. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I'm the only one who uses uh, slides. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, the topic for the day is what I would refer to as a clumsy world and what would governance mean uh, in such a world. So, um, uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh -huh, okay. So, uh, anyway, what I wanted to uh, point out uh, that uh, has been uh, referred to as a certain paradox uh, in the existence of state. Uh, there is a, that was actually alluded to in many places, even the, I would say, the dialectic uh, uh, between universal and uh, in particular for form of universal, uh, the, maybe even the dialectic of autonomy and heteronomy, uh, or more or less the problem that the state tries to be one, but at the same time it's always uh, has remnants of multitude. Uh, it is always a failed attempt to uh, constitute uh, a society as a certain oneness. So basically uh, you can see that uh, uh, this guy is sleeping, uh, even though the unit is uh, kind of there. So uh, I'm uh, moving uh, to a, a brief introduction. The, the idea is that the political world is clumsy. It's kind of like an ordered chaos, not elegant, not either order or chaos. Both are kind of elegant situations underlying uh, of them a singular kind of principle. Uh, so, what about general theory of clumsiness and maybe a clumsy notion of the state and what is the role of the state in a clumsy world? I propose uh, uh, half um, uh, uh, in the <coughs> inten uh, uh, intendedly uh, provocatively that the state should be some sort of master narrator. Now, what about this, uh, this vocabulary, elegant and clumsy? Elegant and clumsy solutions, uh, I'm just pointing out here to several titles uh, re related to uh, my interests, uh, uh, clumsy uh, solutions for wicked problems, clumsy solutions for complex world, uh, the role of leadership, so, one, in one way or another, this is based on Mary Douglas's uh, cultural theory, uh, which is quite uh, well known. Uh, we uh, know uh, from her work, uh, which, is, which has traveled to political science, policy sciences, that uh, ideally, typically, we can distinguish between largely uh, four main uh, uh, kind of uh, decision-making forms. We could call them elegant solutions to uh, problems, maybe simple and complex problems. So we have egalitarianism. Everything should be decided based on equal uh, count uh, in the uh, hierarchy. Some more uh, top-down rules will do the trick. Individualism, uh, let's say, uh, the invisible hand throws the dice and we're all happy. And of course, uh, let's see what happens. Uh, no point in taking any step, fatalism. fatalism. So, but what about clumsy solutions? The idea, uh, even in Mary Douglas, was that uh, those cultures of decision-making uh, that have combinations of different forms of decision making rather than being based on a singular logic are way more sustainable, and way more uh, uh, suitable uh, uh, for uh, the world as we know it. Uh, so, uh, and what about uh, general theory of clumsiness? Here I start with the opposite, the general theory of elegance. I argue uh, uh, 
taking a brief uh, excursus to the foundational moments of uh, modern political uh, philosophy that in a way the elegant world is the world uh, that is in the shadow of Thomas Hobbes. Uh, of course his Leviathan is important as one can suspect, uh, but I'm interpreting it uh, through Quentin Skinner's perspective. We uh, were supposed to have Quentin Skinner here as well, so it's kind of a Skinnerian moment here. So I'm, uh, uh, since I piled up uh, quite a lot of quotations, I'm uh, probably skip uh, 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 some of them. Uh, I can make the um, uh, slides available, and uh, so. Uh, but anyway. Uh, Skinner argues that the idea of a nasty, brutish, and short perspective in the state of nature is actually meant to uh, bring to fore the idea that it doesn't make sense to uh, uh, depict uh, or imagine people as a united body in our natural state. We are entirely disassociated, they are mere multitude. So, uh, so every man is uh, enemy to every man. This is a famous figure. But uh, so we could say that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is kind of like, uh, 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 mm -hmm. I'm having trouble. I wanted to turn the slide back. But anyway, so. Um, uh, when we have the elegant uh, world of chaos, the state of nature uh, is opposite the state of political governance is another elegant world. So, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, uh, this emerges when the multi uh, members of the multitude uh, authorize an individual or assembly to act in their sight. So, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, we as the multitude transform ourselves to, uh, from a multitude to a unified group. So we are not uh, disassociate anymore. We are, in a way, capable of willing and acting as one person. So uh, this means that uh, 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 two additional persons emerged that were uh, non-existent in the state of nature. One of them is the sovereign and the other is the commonwealth or state. Uh, the idea is here uh, overall uh, that uh, we have two elegant worlds, either a chaos and either uh, an order. Uh, what about a different phase? Uh, 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 a little bit earlier, but some consider him uh, to be the postmodern roots of political, uh, being at the postmodern roots at the, of the political uh, thought, uh, even though he uh, wrote a century before. So uh, I would argue that the clumsy world is sort of like uh, in the shadow of uh, Niccolò Machiavelli. Uh, I also point out very briefly that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the idea of uh, lo stato or mantenere lo stato uh, by the 17th century when it was translated into English it was elementary that it was translated not as a status but as a state uh, already. Uh, but uh, more importantly uh, I uh, would point out that since the 70s uh, there's a talk of Machiavellian moment uh, since, uh, since uh, uh, Pocock's work and, and so on, I would say that the idea of uh, political and social world as an ordered chaos between Fortuna and uh, Fortuna and Virtu, uh, the good, bad luck, uh, uh, and the ability to take advantage of it. So we could say that the clumsy world of the political emerges in, in his thought. It is construed as a strategic play with contingency, or as Machiavelli would have it, uh, with Fortuna, as Oliver Marchat puts it in a celebrated book, Post Foundational Political Thought. So uh, uh, here we have uh, a different uh, perspective. Uh, another uh, uh, book about power, I think still one of the best books about power over the last 30 or so years uh, from Stuart Clegg, he also points out that uh, in a way, uh, 
Machiavelli's notion of power was imprecise, contingent, strategic, and organizational, so kind of clumsy, uh, rather than uh, 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 seeking for uh, 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 precision in, uh, uh, in a Hobbesian tradition. So, whereas Hobbes was a legislator of power, uh, thinking about what power is and what uh, uh, it should be, uh, <coughs> so that it, it's uh, legitimate Machiavelli uh, reflected on uh, or interpreted uh, what power does. So the people who have read Foucault, this sounds awkwardly uh, familiar, I guess. Uh, now, uh, what about the clumsy world? So we have a clumsy, let's say, uh, Machiavellian perspective uh, on power and state and so on, and the uh, elegant perspective. And historically, we know that the Hobbesian tradition uh, became way more uh, influential. But uh, I argue that, in a way, we need some sort of uh, clumsy perspective on, uh, um, on state and uh, society. So, uh, in a recent book we published last year, uh, introducing relational political analysis, we are talking about uh, wicked problems. Uh, very briefly, uh, we can distinguish on the axis of whether there's an agreement or disagreement on the definition of the problem or, uh, uh, and the solution of the problem. Simple problems are uh, problems where there's an uh, um, uh, agreement all over the place. Uh, we know what the problem is and what to do uh, about it. Complex problems, we still have some sort of agreement on what is the problem, uh, but we have heated debates on how to solve it. Wicked problems have disagreement all over the place. But logically, there's a fourth option when there's a disagreement on what the problem is, but at, at the same time uh, an agreement how to solve it. So it's quite typical in uh, politics, uh, as we all know, uh, very often we have ideological, uh, stereotypical responses to whatever societal grievances, so we call them deproblematized problems. But uh, besides this agreement-disagreement aspect, we should point out uh, uh, that uh, when it comes to wicked problems, there has to be something more, complexity and uncertainty. Uh, so, uh, very briefly, complexity, when we take the perspective of complexity theory, for instance, we reject the validity of analytical strategies in which things are reducible to the sum of their parts. And in a way, we should pr presume that complex systems are always on the move. They're mutating from one phase into another. So, uh, and wicked problems, serious disagreements combined with complexity and uncertainty. Uh, so, uh, let's uh, just see where we are uh, uh, in, in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. Is it a wicked problem? Uh, we would argue so with colleagues uh, uh, Benjamin Klosch and Jonathan Nukisto in a uh, paper forthcoming soon. So it's not a health crisis anymore. It's obviously an economic crisis, mental health crisis, educational crisis, geopolitical crisis when it comes to maybe vaccine nationalism and so on, uh, growing inequality uh, among the states. Uh, some have basically nine doses per, per person, uh, some have a zero, etc. But what, what is even more interesting, uh, we argue, uh, I hopefully it is more interesting for us, at least, at least it is, epistemic authority crisis. What about the situation when everybody knows uh, how to judge scientific knowledge? Everybody can Google uh, and say that uh, we don't trust this, these uh, uh, corporate uh, 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 purchased opinions, what they call science. Uh, epistemic authority is one of the uh, crucial issues at the third phase, uh, at least, I would say, of, of COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and we argue that uh, something we call processual relationalism, a certain uh, approach uh, uh, to social reality, processual relationalism, would be a good approach to uh, um, to get some sort of handle of these uh, kinds of problems we call wicked problems. So what is it? Uh, here I'm not lo looking in the, into the past, but kind of uh, into the future 
uh, we can point just that there is a deadline coming on for a book uh, with uh, good colleagues from Tallinn University that uh, we have to finish quite soon. Hopefully uh, we are able to do that uh, by the end of this year with the working title uh, a Relational Approach to Governing Wicked Problems from Governance Failure to Failure Governance. So I'm, as a way of uh, proposing my uh, ideas of uh, what is the general theory of clumsiness, so to speak. I'm briefly going over uh, what is this uh, processual relationalism we are breaching there. Uh, uh, so um, the aim of the book is to bring relational sociology, or more specifically process relational sociology, sometimes also re referred to transactional sociology, uh, to bear on the issues of governance. So what would so, kind of like relational uh, approach to governance or relational governance, uh, process relational governance look like? So in a way it's a, an attempt to move from ontological issues, uh, methodological issues uh, as well, to normative issues. How to govern in view of a certain approach to social reality uh, we call process relationalism. So. Uh, Let's talk about the ontological background here very briefly. So we are basing our argument uh, strongly to Dewey and Pentley's uh, important book uh, a couple of generations ago already, but at the moment very much uh, gaining more and more influence, the knowing and the known. So there they uh, distinguish between three perspectives on social action or social reality. Self-action, as the prefix self indicates, refers to an action that is taken up by individual entities that act under their own powers. Basically, it's uh, more or less the multitude of uh, hops. There is a uh, disassociated uh, uh, multitude of entities that act under their own powers. So when we study social problems or processes, we basically reduce them to their instigators. Who is responsible for this problem? So uh, that means, uh, this means studying social problems and processes. Interaction, as the prefix index, uh, uh, inter indicates, is something in between uh, action that takes place among or between entities. So this is a world where uh, where thing is balanced against thing in a causal interconnection. And a typical research strategy in the social sciences is to talk about variables, independent variable, dependent variable, and the combinations. So reducing reality to variables. And in this way, re reifying social processes or phenomena as processes into some sort of entities. Uh, the third perspective, which is uh, kind of a process relational perspective uh, that they uh, uh, Dewey and Bentley and their followers uh, distinguishes transactional or transaction. So uh, we try to uh, bring it, uh, bring this uh, point uh, home by pointing to the prefix trans in a sense that this is an action that in a way transcends entities which are seen as constituted within this action. So. Uh, there is no pre-constituted identities, uh, they are constituted within uh, action. I'm skipping the long, lengthy quote from Dewey and Bentley here. The bottom line here is that if you have this kind of approach to social reality, your uh, conceptual schemes or systems of description, as they call it, are preliminary. You, you shouldn't be presuming that they are uh, grasping any essences of entities, and you shouldn't be presuming that the entities uh, and their essences are detachable from the relations that, in which they are uh, 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 involved. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, here are some uh, quotes uh, from Emir Bayer, Mustafa Emir Bayer, uh, the, who is, was uh, very influential in taking this Julian uh, Bentley point uh, to relational sociology. But, uh, uh -huh. okay, so uh, overall, 
Uh, if you study uh, social processes from the self-actualized perspective, you presume that a process is owned by somebody. You can reduce it to its owner. Problems uh, are instigated uh, by certain actors or structures. Uh, if you uh, presume interactionist perspective, problems are re reified as separate entity, Pro problems are still reducible or processes are reducible. Transactionalist presumes the view of unknown processes. Problems are treated as constitutive uh, 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 processes. You cannot reduce them to anyone, even though uh, we can uh, see moments of uh, ownership here and there, but uh, you cannot see the underlying ownership. So uh, this is kind of like the ontological part of the story, very briefly about the normative uh, part uh, as well. Uh, so, um, uh, let me just remind about the simple, wicked and deproblematized and complex problems. Uh, how to govern in view of uh, different uh, perspectives of the world and uh, different problems we might encounter. So we talk about self-active, interactive and transactive governance. Uh, basically, uh, here we propose uh, uh, some uh, let's say, ideal types, uh, we argue that uh, when we fa we're faced with uh, problems of simple kind, uh, then uh, self-active governance based on, uh, you know, this uh, uh, multitude of entities, dissociated entities kind of view would do the trick. Uh, we might have hierarchy, bureaucracy or market doing the trick. Uh, interactive governance is well suited for complex problems through networks, and uh, its orientation is to solve them, solve them. But when it comes to uh, wicked problems, we argue that its orientation should be on the failure. What failure can we imagine rather than the solution of the problem? And uh, so this is what we argue uh, uh, that relational approach to governance amounts to. And the other side of the coin is that governance can always, and very in, in most cases I would say, uh, is governance as deproblematization. We treat wicked problems as if they were simple problems uh, with uh, ready-made solutions. So uh, to... Uh, uh, put forth uh, the final uh, thoughts of this failure governance or transactive governance. So why do we call it failure governance? We are basically arguing that when we treat uh, the clumsy word of wicked problems, we should be promoting what we call politics of problematization. So it's the opposite of deproblematization. You bring to the fore the uh, failure of your perspective uh, all the time you are aware of uh, the uh, uh, process of complexity reducing activities you perform when you take decisions, uh, make plans. So we borrow here quite a lot as I do in this uh, entire uh, presentation uh, we borrow from Bob Jessops. Uh, so he talks about, uh, for instance, uh, requisite variety deliberate cultivation of flexible repertoire of responses. So, uh, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, maybe, uh, uh, well, it is clumsy in that sense that introduces kind of slack or waste. You have to have uh, 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 many uh, viewpoints, but uh, it also uh, provides a major source of flexibility when faced with failure, and failure is uh, presumed to be uh, the most likely option anyway. So besides that reflexive orientation, you are aware that you cannot fully understand what you are uh, observing, and so you have contingency plans uh, and so on. So why are we are are certain understandings of the situation taken for granted or hegemonic. Uh, and finally, what he calls um, self-reflexive irony. It combines certain optimism of the will with the pessimism of the intelligence. So, irony accepts the completeness and failure as essential, but acts as if completeness and success were possible. So, it's not the cynicism, it's ironism. Uh, anyway, 
so it comes down to the slogan, if you like, from Jessop's uh, text, uh, if one is likely to fail, one can at least choose one's preferred form of failure. Sounds uh, pretty uh, depressing, but we come to that later uh, when we move to the master narrator uh, of uh, uh, state. So, transactive state. What would it look like? Transactive, kind of like uh, being aware that uh, choosing your preferred form of failures uh, is all, the, all you got. So anyway, uh, here I po uh, borrow from uh, many insights from uh, Bob Jessop again. If you look at the titles of his chapters, the state is a social relation or the state as a government plus governance in the shadow of hierarchy, you can see that state is not presumed to be a homogeneous cold monster anyway. It's presumed to be kind of like a multi-dimensional phenomenon. Uh, there are formal dimensions like institutional uh, uh, articulation or modes of representation, modes of uh, uh, intervention. But besides that, also the substantive kind of uh, societal uh, dimension, social basis of state. So uh, how social compromise is institutionalized, how state projects, uh, the overarching kind of uh, directions are uh, uh, framed, how hegemonic vision uh, uh, is uh, is implemented uh, how it emerges. So, and those dimensions are, uh, let's say, intertwined uh, uh, with one another or interpenetrated even. Uh, so, uh, actually, it, uh, it's a huge uh, network of uh, intricate relations, but analytically, we can distinguish uh, that. So, this is the approach, what he calls uh, strategic relational approach or SRA. Now, uh, uh, I would uh, point to even more uh, another recent, well, let's not say recent, but in political theory, yeah, s seven uh, years is quite recent. So, uh, uh, the debate with Colin Hay, uh, Colin Hay puts forth the as if realist ontology of the state. In my view, it's an understanding of a state as an unknown process. So, state is neither real, real nor fictitious, but as if real. So, in a way, state has no agency per se. State lacks a substantive unity. It's a dynamic institutional complex whose unity is at best partial. So, Bob Jessop points to a paradox of state. It is just one institutional ensemble among others. Uh, but its overall responsibility is maintaining a cohesion. So it's a part and a whole at the same time. So it's a, in a way doomed to generate state failure. So uh, what it, uh, uh, what I, this is the uh, final point I want to make here. It's that the state is kind of like a master narrative. The vocabulary behind here is relates to master strategies, centers, and supervisors of society. Uh, of course, uh, here he Hegelian uh, dialectic of Herrschaft and uh, Knetschaft uh, uh, is always, you cannot be a master without a slave or uh, so. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, strategic codification of power relations uh, in Foucault's sense, uh, state is a central bank of symbolic capital uh, or state government plus governance in the shadow of hierarchy. Master signifies nodal points, so uh, master narrative uh, from your reasons work uh, or supervision state, uh, what uh, he uh, points out that uh, we are li living in a supervision state rather than uh, uh, which works mainly through communication networks and informa uh, information. So in that sense, what is the story of the master narrative? There are various heterogeneous stories, but the ma master narrator should somehow facilitate that uh, it works in a certain way. We, it cannot force uh, narratives. Uh, it won't work in the Western world. So. Uh, at least. So uh, here are some final thoughts about failure. And I want to point out that if it sounds depressive, then 
th take a look at this guy's face. It's not depressive at all. This is uh, the former uh, vice president of Taiwan, and Taiwan is the greatest achiever in when it comes to COVID crisis uh, uh, containment, and uh, in our view, exactly because they did this failure governance. There's another uh, a bunch of depressive faces and something in between. So pick up your depressive face, uh, and uh, this is the message I leave you with. Thank you very much.